So the talk, the title was quite interesting, Untouched Scenarios and that comes the brachial plexus injuries. When I saw this, I was just wondering, brachial plexus anatomy is the first thing what we learn in our medical school. And anatomy, that is the first thing we learn and somehow it very often becomes favorite question for all the students and also for the examiners and we all are very much expert in this. Then how it becomes an untouched scenario, why over period of time brachial plexus surgery does not interest so much that is because of some myths which are related to the brachial plexus injuries. And uh, as part of this talk, I think first most important is to just melee off these myths related to this. The first and the most commonly thought thing is that results of brachial plexus injuries are very poor. Nothing much can be done for that. But that's not true because with modern advancement in microsurgery and the nerve transfer, the results are very dramatic. See this patient who is an orthopedic resident when he had a brachial plexus injury. He underwent nerve surgeries and he is now doing orthopedic surgeries and become functionally normal. This is a patient who is a professional cricketer and this is at one year. He has recovered totally normal shoulder and elbow function and he is back to his practicing nets and he is very actively involved in competitive sports and hopefully he may someday make into IPL as well. Another example, a patient who is gone into professional bodybuilding, lifting 130 kgs of weight, a person who can become a musician. So these all professions require so much of fineness in the hand function, which is possible after the nerve surgeries have been done for brachial plexus injuries. Not for everyone, but for partial plexus pulses, patient can be made totally normal and even the total pulses can be helped. So the one message which I want to convey to everyone over here is that treatment of brachial plexus surgery is effective and it is quite effective. It is not really a rare problem at all. So yearly 490 cases of brachial plexus are done at our hospital so that means it is not a really a rare problem and just thinking that it is rare is the main reason for missing these injuries. They often get missed if patient has polytrauma, we will see the fractures but we don't uh, see the patient hand not moving. Any injury in the proximal part of the forearm could uh, lead to missing of these injuries because patient may not moving the shoulder because of pain and later on we see that the nerve itself is not working and any surgery in this region like a lymph node biopsy for example is a common reason for injury which has happened but it is being missed and being neglected and we think that it is going to recover with time. How not to miss is yes we need to examine the patient very properly and one easy way is to check for sensations. So movement may be restricted because of pain, because of fracture, but if sensation is abnormal, that means that there is some nerve injury. And this could be easily done by always doing a secondary survey in all the patients with polytrauma. Other thing what we believe is that most of these patients will improve with time. That again is quite wrong because only the palsies which are associated with shoulder dislocation, proximal humerus fractures, which tend to be a low velocity injuries may recover. But chances of recovery of a closed avulsion injuries is very, very less. Maybe five in 100 patients may recover that to not completely. The last thing we think that the treatment is very complex. Yes, it requires a good amount of understanding because the patients would be of varying type. But by knowing uh, anatomy well, having a systematic approach, good examination skill, we can very easily treat these patients quite effectively. We need to keep in mind the anatomical variations when we are operating and we need to be aware of that before we proceed to surgery. Now coming to the treatment approach, how we proceed with treatment for these patients. Broadly, we can divide as a complete brachial plexus palsy where all the roots are injured. As we see over here, C5 to T1, the hand is totally paralyzed. Partial palsy where only the shoulder is involved, the C5, shoulder and elbow, C5, C6, which is called as upper plexus palsy. 
and when the wrist also is involved it is called extended upper plexus and when only the hand is involved it is called lower plexus so that makes five group of injuries and these five we need to have a specific way how to manage and that will simplify our algorithm for treatment of these patients most decisions are made based on clinical examination there is no need to do repeated mris repeated nerve conduction studies because they may further confuse first we need to take a decision based on our clinical examination and that could be supported by investigation not the other way around basically on examination what we are trying to find is whether the patient has an avulsion or a rupture the basic difference between these two is in an avulsion the nerve has come out of the spinal cord itself so that means the nerve is not available for repair whereas in rupture it is injured outside the foramen that means the proximal part of the nerve is available for repair all the examination should focus on finding this difference in exams if a brachial plexus case comes which many times is coming for dnv students these days the main question is whether is it is avulsion or a rupture so two things which a student must be able to tell is the horner sign indicates avulsion of the lower roots and winging of scapula which happens because of serratus anterior palsy indicates avulsion of the upper roots so that way you cover all the five roots and your answer to the examiner would be quite convincing to him then we just examine all the muscles from top to bottom which is called as walk the plexus and by walking the plexus you will be exactly able to point out at what point beyond which the muscles are not working and that is the site of brachial plexus injury so there is no need to do too much investigations then when to investigate do we really require anything or nothing else is required yeah we do investigate and one of the thing which is useful is an mri especially when you are suspecting clinically that patient has got an avulsion so mri findings of a pseudo meningocele will further strengthen your clinical examination decision that there is an avulsion the problem with avulsion is the nerve is not available for repair so we need to search for other options important thing to remember is nerve conduction study mris both should be done after about one month of the injury not immediately because the pseudo meningocele take some time to form at immediate nerve conduction study the nerve may still be conducting it will not give any useful information at all so it is wastage of money and effort if we do it on one week two weeks three weeks so do any investigation only after four to six weeks when do we operate yes if it is an open injury immediately otherwise minimum 6 weeks waiting because 6 weeks you give time for the spontaneous neuropraxias to recover if they don't recover in 6 weeks then we can proceed for surgery at maximum upper plexus palsy we can wait for 3 months only shoulder involvement we can wait for 6 months even because shoulder is very close to the brachial plexus so the chamu better chance of recovery also the surgery can be done little bit global palsy since all the nerves are injured we must operate early important thing to remember is the golden period of brachial plexus injury ends at 6 months this 6 months is very critical because many times we get carried away by all the other injuries like suppose patient had a hand injury chest injury he had a femur fracture femur got infected we are going to operate that in that patient goes for 6 to 8 months and then that brachial plexus surgery time is over so it is not required to wait for that long at two months the brachial plexus surgery can go along with other treatment what this patient is going because that is that going to give a better result if the patient presents late still we can help them by doing tendon transfers and free functioning muscle transfer but the nerve surgeries are the best nerve surgeries could be a repair grafting or a nerve transfer depending on what is the type of injury and presentation since the injury if the patient presents early it is always good to explore the plexus and see if the original root can be repaired because that will give the maximum number of axons and give a better result however in avulsions and the patients presenting late we need to do the technique what is called as distal nerve transfers 
where we take the normal functioning nerves and transfer them to get a good outcome, as we will see in the next slides. An example of open brachial plexus injury, a perfect case where the nerve is available proximally, we join it with a nerve graft and it is going to give a perfect result because it is an immediate surgery, the nerve is good, it is done well and recovery will happen very soon. If the proximal root not available, we go for distal nerve transfer which means that near to the target muscle, we see if any functioning nerve is there, we take a part of that nerve and transfer to that paralyzed muscle. Advantage is it is very close to the target muscle, so that means the target muscle is recovered, going to recover very quickly. One of the very famous example of the distal nerve transfer is the Oberlin transfer. This is a very amazing concept in which a small fascicle of the ulnar nerve is taken and is transferred to the biceps motor branch in the arm, which is only about an inch away from the biceps. Removing 10 to 15 percent of the ulnar nerve fascicle does not affect the function of ulnar nerve, but this fascicle does magic onto the biceps and in three months itself you will start seeing that elbow flexion will recover. This our paper details how you do this surgery and how you select the fascicles. Some results, this patient with C5 palsy, he underwent nerve transfers for shoulder abduction, a spinal accessory to suprascapular and long head of triceps to axillary to get a result like this. We see totally perfect shoulder abduction. It achieved within one year. This is the result at two years. So these nerve transfers give very nice result and patients are very happy. If patient has got shoulder and elbow, then the palsy is a little bit more extensive, but there is not no problem at all. We have a good nerve transfer for restoring elbow flexion and for shoulder abduction. We can do double transfer for elbow, double transfer for shoulder. We can do the transfer by anterior approach as well. And this is the kind of result we can get for this patient. Pre-op patient having no shoulder and elbow function, and post-operatively, this patient is able to do a very perfect shoulder abduction and we can hardly make out that this patient had any problem at all. So the results of the nerve transfers are quite good and quite assuring as well. Almost 90% of patients would get this type of result. When the palsy is more extensive, we need to use a combination of a nerve transfer and tendon transfer, but still we can get a reasonably good hand function. The problem is when all the roots are injured and all of them are avulsed. So that means nothing is available for repair proximally. So in these cases we go in three stages. First restoring elbow flexion, then the shoulder and then the finger flexion by doing a muscle transfers. Finally this is the type of result we are able to achieve. It is not good, it is not very magical, but it is much much better than the patient whole life not having any function at all and they are able to do some activities with this hand like driving a bike which in our population patients really require it a lot. More than anything we are able to make most of them happy because they are able to drive a bike, they are able to carry on with their passion. This patient always wanted to drive a heavy bike and he is able to do so after the surgeries. Patients are encouraged to use the movement what they have gained for any activities which they are able to do like holding a bag, holding a bucket like this. Anything they use makes them much happy and our purpose is served. Lower plexus palsy is quite uncommon but this can be corrected by doing a tendon transfers like this. This patient had a biceps to finger flexor transfer and you can see he is doing little adjustment but he is functional and he is happy. To summarize, Brachial plexus injuries are challenging, but with good understanding of the anatomy, examination, systematic approach, we can help most of these patients. Investigations we should order very judiciously, minimum four to six weeks after the injury. Early nerve surgery is the best. They should be done within six months, preferably within first three months. Secondary surgeries also can be helpful, but we should treat all the patients early and it, let it not remain an untouched scenario. It greatly enables the patient to live a better life and they can go with their dreams and do whatever they wanted to do. Thank you very much.